Great, thanks very much. So thank you all for coming. Um, and thanks to Nick and um, the other organizers for putting this together. Uh, the experiment seems to have worked very well so far, so I'll try to keep it up. Um, so as you can see, today I am talking about dynamical and geometrical approaches to space-time theories. Um, this is a topic which has aroused a lot of interest in the past few years, um, but it's also a topic which is sometimes quite hard to get into because there are so many moving parts. So what I want to do today is to try and tease out the different aspects to these debates, um, and hopefully we'll have some time to discuss each one. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of different uh, subtopics that I'm going to go through. Uh, my intention is to pause at the end of each one to see if there's any immediate questions, um, but then I'll have a bigger pause for discussion at the end of this section, um, which will take us to the end of the first half, um, and then a bigger pause for discussion at the end as well. Um, and roughly speaking, the first half of the talk is going to regard these issues as they play out in special relativity, um, and then the second half will regard the issues as they play out in general relativity. Okay, good. Uh, so let's start off by talking about the dynamical approach. What is this? Um, well, let's first of all present some major players. So here are some of the major players, uh, major defenders of the dynamical approach. So first of all, we have Harvey Brown and Oliver Pooley. They really kicked off uh, these debates at the start of the 2000s with two very influential papers. Um, and then this was followed up in Physical Relativity, which is Harvey Brown's book from 2005. Um, after that, a number of other philosophers of physics got on board and sought to defend the dynamical approach. Um, so here we have Brian Pitts, who's an excellent philosopher of physics at Cambridge, who has written a number of papers defending something like the dynamical view. Uh, we have Eleanor Knox, who's a previous PhD student of Harvey Brown um, and is now famous in herself for the view space-time functionalism, which in some sense evolved out of Brown's views. Um, how exactly the dynamical approach overlaps with space-time functionalism is something that I'm going to talk about at the end of today. Uh, and finally, we have here our good friend Tushar Menon, who's also uh, worked on a number of papers regarding the dynamical approach. And there are other people as well, of course. Um, on the other hand, we have proponents of something like a geometrical view, uh, a view which the dynamical approach is trying to situate itself against. Um, so four of the major players here are first Tim Maudlin, second uh, Michel Janssen, third John Norton, and fourth Michael Friedman. Uh, Brown and Pooley would take themselves to be objecting to various aspects of the views of all of these authors on space-time theories, although that's not necessarily to say that all of these people share exactly the same views. Uh, as we'll see later, there are important differences between, for example, the views of Maudlin and the views of Janssen. Okay, good. Um, so those are our two camps, but what is the dynamical approach? If you pick up a paper on the dynamical approach, it might not be super obvious uh, what exactly the core tenets of this position are. Um, so I'm going to cut to the chase by trying to tell you uh, what I take to be kind of two core claims which a proponent of the dynamical view is making. The first is this, that fixed background space-time structures, such as the Minkowski metric of special relativity or Newton's absolute space in Newtonian mechanics, are to be ontologically reduced to the symmetries of dynamical equations governing matter fields. So in this sense, the dynamical approach, when it comes to fixed background space-time structures, is supposed to be some novel form of relationalism, whereby space-time is reduced to something to do with matter fields, in this case, to be reduced to the symmetries of the dynamical equations governing matter fields. Of course, I'll go through in much more detail what this is supposed to mean uh, in a few minutes. The second core tenant of the dynamical approach is this, that no, space type, no piece of space-time structure, whether it's fixed or dynamical, in the latter case that could be the metric field of general relativity, is necessarily surveyed by physical bodies, necessarily has its intervals read off by, say, rods and clocks. Rather, in order to ascertain whether that's the case, you have to attend to the details of the physics governing those rods and clocks. Uh, you can't just ab initio declare that this piece of space-time structure will be surveyed by matter. In order to figure out whether that's the case or not, you have to look at the details of how that matter is working. So this is what Butterfield, in a nice 2007 paper on the dynamical approach, which in my opinion should be read more, people tend to forget about this one. Uh, that's what Butterfield calls Brown's moral. Um, and we'll talk about that a lot as well. For the time being, let's focus on the first of these two points. Um, so just to go through this in a little bit more detail, uh, the proponents of the dynamical approach are maintaining that space-time structure of our world is what it is because of the dynamical laws governing uh, matter. 
That is, the dynamical laws are relatively fundamental and space-time structure is derivative. Like I said, in this sense, the view is a modern day form of relationalism. It is important though to not associate the dynamical geometrical debate with the relationalism, substantivalism debate too closely. Um, so for example, various different proponents of a geometrical view may or may not be substantivalist. They may or may not think that space-time is a base element of their ontology. Um, so you can't just cleanly associate, say, the geometrical view with substantivalism. That would be too quick. Um, although it is true that that first point about the dynamical approach, that is a point about which is reasonably associated with relationalism. Okay, good. Uh, so all of that by way of background. Uh, let's now go into the details uh, of this first point even more. Um, so how exactly is this ontological reduction of fixed space-time structures to dynamical symmetries supposed to work uh, for proponents of, that should be for proponents of the dynamical view? Uh, what we'd like to do is to uh, see metaphysically how this is working. Um, in his 2009 essay review of the dynamical approach, Nick Huggett, who's with us today, of course, uh, rightly criticized, I think, uh, physical relativity for being a bit sparse on the metaphysics about how this is working. Um, and there's definitely more to say here. So this is what I want to kind of try and spell out now on behalf of Brown. Um, to do that requires a little bit of background. So first, uh, let's talk about dynamical symmetries and space-time symmetries. Um, this might be familiar to a lot of you already, but I'll just go through it anyway. Um, so first of all, dynamical symmetries. These are the transformations which prefer, preserve the form of certain dynamical laws. So take, for example, the Newton-Poisson equation of Newtonian gravity. If I write that in a coordinate system and I do a coordinate transformation, I'll find that that form of that equation is preserved if that transformation is a Galilean transformation. Um, so I know that the Galilean transformations are the symmetries, or at least some of the symmetries of the Newton-Poisson equation. Similarly, take Maxwell's equations of electrodynamics. Um, if I do a Poincaré transformation, um, then I'll find that the form of those equations is preserved. So those transformations are some of the symmetries of Maxwell's equations. Good. Um, on the other hand, we have space-time symmetries. These are transformations which preserve a specified piece of geometrical structure. So the symmetries of Galilean space-time, what people often regard as being the right space-time setting for Newtonian mechanics, are the Galilean transformations. The symmetries of the Minkowski metric um, are the Poincaré transformations. Um, so to see that, just think about the Minkowski metric and write it in a uh, diagonal form, minus one, 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 one. Um, and then think about the coordinate transformations which would preserve that form. Um, and you'll find that they are the Poincaré transformations. So those are your space-time symmetries there. Okay, so we've got these two kinds of symmetries. Um, what's the relation between them? So very famously in his book, World Enough and Space-Time, John Ehrman declared that space-time symmetries should match dynamical symmetries in any given theory. Um, and he broke this down into two principles. So the first he called SP1, symmetry principle one. And it says that any dynamical symmetry of a theory T is a space-time symmetry of T. And then SP2 just goes the other way around. It says any space-time symmetry of T is a dynamical symmetry of T. And he said that these are what he called adequacy conditions on a space-time theory. Uh, it's not logically incoherent to have these being violated, but it's certainly a good idea to have them being satisfied. Why is it the case that uh, we would like them to be satisfied? Well, let's just uh, think about that a bit. So when one is thinking about this, it's always good, I think, to bear in mind this motto that something having more symmetry means that it has less structure uh, and vice versa. So now let's think about what would happen if SP1 were violated. So look here, SP1 says any dynamical symmetry of T is a space-time symmetry of T. If that were false, then it would be the case that there's some dynamical symmetries which are not space-time symmetries, which means that space-time uh, has more structure than the dynamics uh, in light of this motto, which means that there's undetectable space-time structure. There's space-time structure to which your dynamics is not sensitive. Uh, and the reason that we think that is bad is because it violates what you might call an Occamist norm, not to introduce undetectable uh, surplus structure into your physical theories. Uh, so it violates an Occamist norm on physical theorizing. Um, 
this is discussed very nicely in the fairly recent paper by Das Gupta on symmetries, which I would recommend. On the other hand, uh, what happens if SP2 is violated? Well, just to go back to the form of SP2 here, it says any space-time symmetry of T is a dynamical symmetry of T. Uh, so if that failed, there would be space-time symmetries which aren't dynamical symmetries. That would mean that um, your dynamics can measure things which don't exist. Uh, that there are measurable but non-existent geometrical quantities. Um, and that is pretty perplexing, uh, seems fairly dodgy. Uh, Gordon Bellot described it in 2000 as arrant knavery, uh, so clearly not uh, something which you would want either. So there are good grounds to think that you should have it the case that your space-time symmetries match your dynamical symmetries in any given theory. Um, but you might still ask, if I insist that the adequacy conditions hold, why do they hold? Um, and there are different answers that you can give here. Um, so a geometrical view would say that space-time explains why the dynamical symmetries are what they are, and therefore why the adequacy conditions are satisfied. Um, but a dynamical view would want to do, go the other way around. It would want to say that dynamical symmetries explain why space-time structure is what it is, which comes back to that relational thesis which I was mentioning before. Um, so here's Brown and Pooley on this, where they're basically saying these things uh, in one of their two articles um, from the early 2000s. Uh, they write this, as a matter of logic alone, if one postulates space-time as a self-standing autonomous element in one's theory, it need have no constraining role on the form of the laws governing the rest of the theory's models. So how is its influence supposed to work? Unless this question is answered, space-time cannot be taken to explain the covariance of the dynamical laws. Um, and they cite various problem cases there where you have space-time structure, but the matter doesn't, or the dynamical laws don't have the same symmetries. And I'll come back to those problem cases in a bit. Uh, but in light of those cases, they say, you know, appealing to space-time to explain why the adequacy conditions hold seems obscure. So they want to see something different. And they write this. From our perspective, the direction of explanation goes the other way around. It's the Lorentz covariance of the laws that underwrites the fact that the geometry of space-time is Minkowskian. Here they're thinking about special relativity. So rather they think it's the case that the laws explain why the space-time structure is what it is. But we still have this concern, right? I still haven't answered our question about how metaphysically this is supposed to work. Can you in fact state dynamical laws or understand them as obtaining without presupposing facts about space-time structure, which is something which the dynamical approach up to this point seems to be assuming. Um, so the right way to go here um, it's increasingly well appreciated, uh, is to look to the metaphysics of laws of nature and to try to appropriate some of the things which have been going on there um, into the space-time dynamical geometrical debate context. So let's see how this goes. So recall first that there are two main classes of position uh, in the debate about the metaphysics of laws of nature. The first are governing conceptions of laws of nature, according to which laws of nature somehow, in some way, to be made precise, constrain or explain the behavior of matter. So two examples here are the armstrong depretsky tuli position, according to which laws of nature are higher order necessitation relations between universals. We don't need to go into the details of that, although we can if people are interested. Uh, and here we also have Maudlin. So Maudlin has a view according to which laws of nature are primitive elements of his ontology, and they constrain physical goings on. We also have a different camp though, a non-governing conception of laws of nature, according to which laws of nature are again, in some sense to be articulated, codifications now of the behavior of matter. So it's more that the matter explains what the laws of nature are rather than the other way around. And the most famous example of this is the Mill Ramsey Lewis best systems account of laws, according to which laws of nature are the simplest and strongest codifications of the human mosaic. Some, uh, physical goings on. So there's clear connections with uh, the dynamical geometrical debate here. This governing conception seems to be more like the geometrical view. Uh, the non-governing conception seems to be more like what the dynamical view is after. Now, back in 2006, Nick Huggett, again, uh, hi Nick, uh, uh, helped the dynamical view out, although uh, that only, people only realized later on that he was helping them out. 
Uh, Nick tried to extend the non-governing Mill Ramsey Lewis conception of laws to space time as well. Um, and he called this uh, regularity relationalism. Um, and it turns out, as people like Nick, but also um, Oliver Pooley and Oliver Pooley's student Simon Stevens noticed afterwards, that this is pretty much what the dynamical approach seems to be after. So how does regularity relationalism work? It's actually kind of simple. So let your Humean mosaic be a smooth four-dimensional manifold um, with some fields on there. We'll take that to be the physics, uh, which we're going to try and extract geometry from. Um, you follow the Mill Ramsey Lewis best systems account and you try and construct the simplest and strongest codification of that Humean mosaic. Um, and you describe that in a coordinate system. So you get some simplest and strongest codification of the Humean mosaic in a particular coordinate system. But now you can think about doing a coordinate transformation, which will generate distinct mathematical representations of the Humean mosaic, given using distinct coordinatizations. And it might happen that among all such coordinatizations, the codifications of the Humean mosaic, there are some coordinate systems in which things simplify. There are some coordinate systems in which the fields are described using a member of the class. When the fields are described using a member of the class, it turns out that the values at space time points satisfy some particularly simple and elegant descriptions. And moreover, that those frames are related by certain symmetries. Uh, if that's so, then you can take your simple slash elegant equation uh, as expressing a dynamical law for the mosaic, a la the best systems account, and the symmetries of the equation, the transformations to which relate the descriptions in which your codification takes its simplest form, can be associated with a derivative space-time structure. You just say space-time is whatever the symmetries that my mill ramsey lewis is whatever shares the symmetries of my mill ramsey lewis best systematization of the Humean mosaic. Um, so you start off with your mosaic, you extract laws of nature, but then you look at the symmetries of the laws of nature that you've extracted and you associate that with a space-time structure which is understood as being derivative. That's the idea behind this regularity relationalism. So for more on this, uh, I would recommend Huggett's review of the dynamical approach, um, but also these papers by Pooley and Stevens subsequently. If it works, then uh, that's a good way, I think, of providing some metaphysical, uh, you know, backing up metaphysically what the dynamical approach is supposed to be after, rather than just simply asserting um, space-time as a codification of the symmetries of laws of nature, which one might find to be too quick. Okay, so to summarize so far, and then I'll take a brief break for discussions. Uh, so up to this point, uh, we've seen how the dynamical approach as a program of ontological reduction is supposed to play out in the context of theories with fixed space-time structure. Uh, namely as a form of regularity relationalism. Um, and we've also seen Brown and Pooley's concerns about whether space-time can explain why dynamical symmetries are what they are. Um, and it's the second thing which I want to talk about now in the next section, but I will just pause for any questions there if there are any. Feel free to just shout out or write it in the chat, but I don't see anything at the moment. Is everyone happy? Cool. Okay, so let's carry on then. So space-time and explanation. What I want to think about now is whether those brown Pooley critiques of how could it be the case that space-time is explaining the behavior of matter are too fast. As a kind of autobiographical note, I used to side with them, but I now think that there are ways of understanding what the geometrical approach is about, which don't make it subject to these brown Pooley critiques. So that's what I want to explain in this section. Okay, so as I indicated before, proponents of the dynamical approach cite many apparent problem cases for the geometrical view, in which it seems like space-time structure just isn't constraining the behavior of matter. So there are loads of examples in the literature, but here are just five. So just think about, for example, Newtonian gravity set in Newtonian space-time. This is something that a lot of us will be familiar with. Uh, in this case, Newtonian space-time has more structure than the laws of Newtonian gravity are sensible, sensitive to. So it's violating Ehrman's adequacy conditions. 
But then a dynamical proponent might ask, well, it can't be the case then that this is constraining matter to have its symmetries because matter doesn't uh, have its symmetries. It has a richer symmetry group. Uh, another example would be ether theories of the kind that people were thinking about uh, before Einstein came along in 1905. So phenomenologically, things look Lorentz invariant, but according to these ether theorists, the base level symmetries of your physical theories are uh, the Galilean symmetries. So that seems to be a case, again, in which space-time structure, the Galilean symmetries, isn't being mirrored by the symmetries of matter, which at least phenomenologically look to be Lorentz symmetries. Um, another example is the Jacobson-Mattingly theory. This is sort of similar to the first case, a case where dynamical symmetries come apart from space-time symmetries. Uh, we've got this example from Pitts of universally coupled massive scalar gravity. This is a bimetric theory in which you have multiple metrics, uh, and it's not obvious which of those is supposed to be space-time. Uh, and so it's not obvious which of those is supposed to be doing the constraining work a la a proponent of a geometrical view. Um, and then the final example is about something in general relativity, so clocks in girdle spacetime. Uh, this is something which uh, Tushar Menon and uh, Niels Linneman, again with us here today, uh, and myself wrote about a couple of years ago. Uh, it turns out that clocks do weird things in certain general relativistic spacetimes, and they might not read off, uh, say, your metric field of general relativity. Um, and so that, again, on the face of it, seems to be a problem case for a geometrical view because rods and clocks are not adverting to the specified space-time structure. Space-time structure doesn't seem to be doing the constraining work that a geometrical proponent is after. So these problem cases fall into kind of two camps. Um, the first are cases in which space-time symmetries just don't align with dynamical symmetries. The first three cases that I wrote down on the previous slide have that form. Um, and we might label that um, in the language which uh, Tushar wrote uh, or came up with, uh, that that's a failure of theoretical space-time. It's a failure of your designated piece of structure to be what he calls theoretical space-time, when its symmetries don't coincide with the symmetries of the dynamical laws. But there's also a second kind of case, and these are cases in which the symmetries do coincide with the symmetries of the dynamical laws, but nevertheless, your rods and clocks don't read off intervals of the given piece of structure. So our clocks in Gödel space-time is a case like that. So our matter is in fact locally Poincaré invariant. Our metric field is locally Poincaré invariant. I'll come back to what this means a bit later. Uh, so I have something which qualifies as theoretical space-time, but nevertheless, my rods and clocks aren't reading off intervals of the piece of space-time structure. So that's what he calls a piece of a failure of that piece of structure to be operational space-time. Um, just to give some jargon, which I might uh, use a bit, uh, a bit more later. But our central question really is, are these apparent problem cases really so damning for the geometrical view? Um, let's first focus on the failures of pieces of structure to be theoretical space-time, cases in which the dynamical symmetries seem to come apart from the space-time symmetries. So, so far, and when we think again about that Brown and Pooley quote, like how is this explanation supposed to work? We seem to be taking the geometrical position to be the view that a certain piece of structure, say the Minkowski metric of special relativity, is invariably constraining matter whenever it's present in a theory to manifest its symmetries. But that seems to be a bad way of understanding the geometrical approach because there just seem to be problem cases where this is false, where say you have a Minkowski metric, but matter isn't adverting to it. Um, so, insofar as that's the geometrical view, I agree it's bad and it fails in light of these problem cases. But the thing is that there are other ways of understanding the geometrical view, other very natural ways of understanding it, which don't seem to face these problems. So what if instead we understand it as something like this? Uh, it's more like a conditional claim. If one has matter which couples to this piece of geometrical structure in such and such a way, then that geometrical structure can explain why the laws have such and such symmetries. So for example, take say a Klein-Gordon equation, which looks something like the Minkowski metric coupled to some derivatives of a scalar field is equal to zero. Now I can appeal to the fact that there's a Minkowski metric there to explain why this equation has Poincaré symmetries. 
Uh, and that seems totally fine, right? This equation has symmetries because it features them in cost metric. That seems like a much more reasonable kind of explanation. It's not making this kind of universal claim about the power of a Minkowski metric to constrain all possible dynamical equations to advert to its symmetries. It's just saying, if I have this equation, which is coupled to my matter, if I have this piece of structure, which is coupled to my matter, then I can use that piece of structure to explain certain facts about the equations which govern that matter or the behavior of that matter. And this seems to be much closer to what people like Maudlin have in mind. Um, so in his book, which by the way, I would highly recommend, Philosophy of Physics, Space and Time, uh, Maudlin writes this, the fundamental requirement of a relativistic theory uh, is that the physical laws should be specifiable using only the relativistic space-time geometry. For special relativity, this means in particular Minkowski space-time. So the idea is, look, I'm not interested in these weird cases where I have matter which might couple to other pieces of structure such that its symmetries don't coincide with the symmetries of the Minkowski metric. Rather, I'm saying, if I have matter which couples to this object, the Minkowski metric, uh, and that's the fundamental requirement of special relativity, then I can use this piece of structure, the Minkowski metric, to explain facts about the dynamical laws, namely that they have uh, Poincaré symmetries, uh, and in turn facts about the behavior of matter, namely that physical objects manifest effects like length, length contraction and time dilation. So this seems to me to be, when we think about th things in this way, just a way of evading the brown pulley concern. So I would call this more nuanced version of a geometrical view, a qualified geometrical view, in contrast with the stronger version of the geometrical view, which I would now regard as being a straw man version of the geometrical view, uh, which you might call the unqualified geometrical approach. Uh, if I stipulate that I'm only interested in couplings to the Minkowski metric, then I can use this thing to explain facts about all special relativistic laws. So I would claim, people disagree, I'd very much like to hear that from them, uh, that the qualified geometrical view uh, is a perfectly legitimate position to hold. What about these issues of operational space-time, cases in which we do have symmetry coincidence, but nevertheless our rods and clocks aren't reading off intervals of the given piece of structure? Well, I think proponents of a qualified geometrical view should just concede that this is possible, uh, but maintain that they can still use that piece of structure to explain certain facts about the dynamics, namely you can, you, you can appeal to the main cost metric to say, explain why dynamical equations have a certain form with certain symmetries. Um, they're not seeking to explain everything. Uh, they're just saying, look, I can use this piece of geometrical structure to explain some things, in particular the symmetries of the laws. Okay, so let us grant then that on the qualified geometrical approach, a given piece of structure, say the Minkowski metric, can explain certain facts about the dynamical laws. For example, the symmetries of a set of dynamical laws like Maxwell's equations. We'd still maybe like to know more about the kind of explanation at play here. So one notion of explanation which comes up a lot in the literature on dynamical and geometrical approaches is what you might call a constructive explanation. This is derivative on Einstein's distinction between principle theories and constructive theories. Principle theories take certain phenomenologically well-grounded uh, regularities, raise them to the status of postulates, and attempt to derive further predictions therefrom. So classic example, Einstein's 1905 presentation of rel special relativity, but also thermodynamics. Constructive theories attempt to get to the kind of physical underlying uh, microdynamical facts which explain why we see the regularities in principle theories. So the idea is that principle theories will have associated deeper constructive theories. Um, in the case of thermodynamics, the associated constructive theory would be uh, statistical mechanics. So as I said, one notion of explanation at play here is constructive explanation. For us, we can take this to be a sense of explanation in which phenomenological effects are explained by reference to real physical objects, um, if possibly unobservable physical objects. So the question that we might now ask is, if I'm a geometrician, a proponent of a geometrical view, uh, can I give constructive explanations of the behavior of matter? And I think the right thing to say is this, if a qualified geometrical 
view proponent is a substantivalist, i.e. they believe that this piece of structure, say the Minkowski metric of special relativity, is something real and out there in the world and not reducible to matter, then they can offer constructive explanations of certain physical effects governed by matter. So they might say something like this. My matter, say a Klein-Gordon field, couples to this substantival metric field in the Klein-Gordon equation. This explains why its laws have such and such symmetries, and so explains why we witness such, such and such special relativistic effects. The fact that I'm appealing to something real and concrete in the world, because I'm a substantivalist about this object, means that there is a certain sense in which I'm offering a constructive explanation. And this is exactly what, for example, Michel Janssen, one proponent of a geometrical view, says in his 2009 paper on the topic. But if a proponent of a geometrical view is not a substantivalist, um, then they can't offer constructive explanations, I would claim, because they don't think that that object is actually real. Um, but what I would want to say is that even if a geometrician doesn't uh, hyperstatize space-time, i.e. isn't a substantivalist, uh, and so concedes that space-time can't offer constructive explanations, um, there are still other kinds of explanations which they might be able to give. So here are two examples. So suppose that I'm a, geometric, a proponent of a geometrical view. I want to say that space-time explains the behavior of matter, but I'm also not a substantivalist. So a constructive explanation is not available to me. But here are some other kinds of explanations which might still be available to me. The first is what Dorato and Feline call a structural explanation. This is kind of like an explanation by analogy. So you say, um, look, my matter fields have, say, Poincaré symmetries, but so too does this object, um, Minkowski metric, have Poincaré symmetries. I can explain why matter does what it does and manifests behavior associated with these Poincaré symmetries by appeal to this Minkowski space-time, and I'm kind of explaining by analogy. I'm saying uh, I can make better sense of these properties of matter by looking to this piece of structure, even if I don't hyperstatize it. Uh, another kind of explanation would be a Friedmanian unificatory explanation. So the idea here is I have maybe loads of different matter fields which all manifest Poincaré symmetries. Uh, well, those are all kind of bundled up in a Minkowski metric. I can just point to that object to explain uh, in a unificatory way the behavior of all of these different matter fields, uh, even if I don't actually believe that that piece of space-time structure is something out there in the world. So um, the moral then is if a proponent of a geometrical view believes in the independent reality of space-time, she seems to be able to offer constructive explanations of physical effects. If they're not a substantivalist, then that's not to say that no notions of explanation are available to them. There might still be other kinds of explanation to which a proponent of a geometrical view could appeal in order to explain certain facts about the behavior of matter. So to summarize here, and again, I'll pause for discussion. So far, we've seen how the dynamical approach can be understood as a form of regularity relationalism. We've seen Brown and Pooley's concerns about the ability of space-time to explain facts about the behavior of matter. But what I've tried to argue is that this is based on a certain kind of straw man view of the geometrical approach. And once we go to a qualified geometrical approach, it's not obvious that their critiques succeed. We've also seen different senses in which space-time might be explanatory of facts about uh, matter or about the dynamics on this qualified geometrical view. Um, and what I want to do now is to turn to a famous critique of the dynamical approach. Um, but again, I'll just pause to see if anyone has any questions right now. Anybody want to bring something up? Oh, Sebas has a question, I think. Hey, James. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for the talk so far. It's very clear. I just have a sort of clarificatory question about um, the last bit about explanation. So I was imagining that maybe an obvious, also controversial alternative, and I don't know if this is included in the structuralist explanation you just mentioned, mm -hmm. saying something like, look, there are some instances of uh, mathematical explanations of physical phenomena outside physics. Uh, uh, why not think that in physics also there are these kinds of explanations of physical stuff uh, by mathematical yep. facts? 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is controversial itself, but it's another way. And I, I was wondering if you think this is like, yeah, one of the options in the table, on the table. Yeah, it seems to me kind of similar to the structural explanation. So yes, they, they are kind of appealing to this Minkowski metric, say qua mathematical object rather than qua anything physical and saying, look at this properties of this mathematical object. This can illuminate certain facts about the physics. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they seem to be on the same page as you there. I think what you are envisaging is quite similar to the Dorato Feline line. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Could I had a? Could you just say again what you took a constructive explanation to be? I mean, yeah, I had so I sort of had in mind that it would have to actually appeal to dynamical laws. So clearly, that's not what's happening. It's a little gen more general than. Um. So. I think there's a lot of nuances here. For example, you might dis distinguish between fundamental and non-fundamental constructive explanations, but just setting that aside, the idea of a constructive explanation is that you appeal to something physical to explain something else. And so here I'm pointing to the Minkowski metric, which if I'm a substantivalist, I think is something physical. And I'm ex using it to explain certain facts about the dynamical laws by saying something like this physical object, the Minkowski metric couples to these fields, say scalar fields, in the Klein-Gordon equation, that object therefore explains in a constructive way uh, why those fields are doing what they're doing. Does that help? Now you might, I think uh, there's a bit of ambiguity about what one might want to count as a constructive explanation because some people think it should point to the fundamental physics. Uh, and so if you're, if you're interested in like a fundamental constructive explanation, well if you think the Minkowski metric is kind of real but derivative on some like quantum gravity stuff then you might not think it counts as uh as offering a fundamental constructive explanation but that's an extra level of weeds which i was trying to avoid okay thanks um looks like jeremy has a question hi yeah james thanks so much for the talk so far um i was, I was hoping to uh, maybe um uh, prod you to say a, a little bit more about the notion of ontological reduction at play in, in that in this first point here, um, specifically because I'm, I'm maybe a little worried that uh, this case of reduction is not like other cases of ontological reduction that we may be familiar with, um, especially if um, so. I have in mind something like eliminative ontological reduction, where we want to get rid of the entity and replace it with something else, mm -hmm. um, like e.g. Uh, I've been thinking about subjective probability and uh, sub uh, subjective probabilists uh, want to get rid of chances um, and replace them with certain sorts of credences, um, for example, via the Dave Nettie representation of theorem. So, so in this way, they, they eliminate reference to the object. Uh, but it seems like the procedure that you were talking about um, uh, isn't, isn't so concerned with eliminating reference to e.g. the metric structure, right? It's almost more like there's a consistency check going on. Um, yeah. Uh. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting because as we both know, Brown is also a proponent of subjectivism about probability. And so I've kind of worried, well, not worried, but wondered for a long time, like how analogous his views on space time are to his views on probability, um, which I think is an interesting question which someone should explore. Um, but when one is looking at I mean, I think it's, there's opportunity for a proponent of the dynamical view to eliminate reference to space-time. They can say, look, I just use this as convenient term to refer to the dynamical symmetries, but I didn't have to uh, if, the, if they're following like a regularity relationalist program. Do you find that? Yeah, I, I guess to quickly follow up, is, is, the, is the metric, is there a way to state uh, the uh, dynamical laws that does not invoke the metric structure at all? Um, so, I, I, so everything here is kind of coordinate based, right? Um, so you start off with your human mosaic, which is fields on space type on and some manifold. I haven't written down any dynamical laws yet. I will write down a coordinate based description of those dynamical laws. And then I'll think about the transformations which relate to coordinate descriptions, which maximally simplify. Um, and then I'll say, what are the symmetries which take me between those frame, between those coordinate systems? And now what is the mathematical object which has those symmetries? And so this is something like what David Wallace has 
presented in detail as a Kleinian approach to, to, uh, to geometry as a way of like understanding what the dynamical view is doing as well. But I would, I would say that at no point there did I assume metric properties. Yeah, I mean, if you like, yeah. the way you state the laws is you write down the mathematical form and then you say there exist coordinates in which the laws take this form. That's really... Yeah, uh, that, that, that's, that's quite helpful. Yeah, thank you. But we, yeah, so um, th I think this is definitely one of the main points of contention between proponents of geometrical views and dynamical views, where people, proponents of geometrical views are often used to thinking about things in like a coordinate independent differential geometric way. And then they, if you think like that, it's quite hard to understand what someone is on about. Even if you write something in a coordinate system implicitly, you've got an object there. But a proponent of a dynamical view is kind of coming from a different angle. Cool. Great. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll crack on then. So um, the next section is going to relate somewhat to Jeremy's question anyway, um, although more with respect to manifold structure than to presupposing metric structure. Uh, so this is Norton's challenge. So Norton wrote a quite critical paper about the dynamical view uh, in 2008, which came out in the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science. So here's John Norton, and here is his, a quote from his paper. Uh, so Norton writes, constructivists such as Harvey Brown urge that the geometries of Newtonian and special relativistic spacetimes result from the properties of matter. Whatever this may mean, it commits constructivists to the claim that these space-time geometries can be inferred from the properties of matter without recourse to spatiotemporal presumptions or with few of them. I, I argue that the construction project only succeeds if constructivists antecedently presume the essential commitments of a realist conception of space-time. So they're kind of implicitly assuming space-time structure and so they can't get that project off the ground. Um, but like I said, this is more concerned with manifold structure than with metric structure. So just to remind you, uh, when we construct space-time theories, and we are thinking about them, uh, well, I'll just write, when we construct space-time theories, we start off by writing down a manifold, and then we write down certain, say, metric structure on that manifold. So, for example, the space-time structure of special relativity is taken to be some manifold, and then a Minkowski metric living on that manifold, if I'm thinking about things in a coordinate independent differential geometric way. Uh, the Galilean space-time structure of Newtonian mechanics is it's more complicated tuple of objects where I still have a manifold and then I have separate spatial and temporal metrics. We don't need to go into the details there. Um, Norton's claim is that you've got to presuppose this manifold uh, in order to write down dynamical equations for matter fields and so in order to get relationalism about the metric off the ground. You could also think about this in the regularity relationalist framework. So we started off with our Humean mosaic being a manifold with some fields on it. So you're already presupposing something spatiotemporal would be Norton's criticism. Uh, so the thought then would be that Brown's approach fails because uh, it's implicitly making spatiotemporal presuppositions. What we would like to ask is, is this fair? Um, and I'm going to present two responses uh, to Norton, which have been offered uh, on behalf of the dynamical approach. So the first is from Pooley's uh, 2013 paper on substantivalism and relationalism about space-time, um, which, by the way, has a very nice short summary of the dynamical approach as well. Uh, so Pooley says, the advocate of the dynamical approach need not be understood as eschewing all primitive spatiotemporal notions, Pache Norton, 2008. In particular, one might take as basic the topological extendedness of the material world in four dimensions. The project was to reduce chronogeometric metric facts to symmetries, not to recover the entire spatiotemporal nature of the world from no spatiotemporal assumptions whatsoever. So the proponent of the dynamical view is trying to ontologically reduce, say, Minkowski metric structure and special relativity to the dynamical laws. And we've seen that that seems to be possible if you're a regularity relationalist, but they're not trying to get rid of manifold structure as well. That just wasn't part of the project. Um, that's a kind of defensive rather than positive reaction to Norton, but I think it's fair enough that Norton just kind of maybe overstates the ambition of the dynamical approach. Um, but others have argued that it's uh, unreasonable to say that Brown doesn't have a relationalist account of the manifold. So for example, um, in his 2000, sorry, in his 1997, uh, so much earlier paper, uh, Brown writes, in pre-quantum physics then, 
space-time points are either are perhaps best viewed not as entities in their own right, but as correlations or links between the individual degrees of freedom of distinct physical fields. So somehow, in a way which deserves more detail, Brown in fact does want to get rid of the manifold. Uh, later in his book, near the end, uh, when he's thinking about the whole argument of general relativity, Brown writes the simplest and to my mind the best conclusion and one which tallies with our usual intuitions concerning the gauge freedom in electrodynamics uh, is that space-time manifold is a non-entity. So in fact, there's textual evidence that Brown does want to get rid of the manifold. Now that obviously doesn't necessarily fully respond to Norton just yet because we still need the positive story about how this is going to work. Uh, Norton maybe has even more room to say, well, you want to do this, but you can't unless uh, we get some more details. Um, I just want to flag today that very recently Tushar Menon has used the machinery of algebraic fields, uh, which you can show to be equivalent to, mathematically equivalent to formulating things in terms of manifolds, uh, to show that manifold points can be understood as structural properties of matter. So the idea is he takes our framework in which I have a manifold and certain physical fields governed by certain dynamical equations, and he translates that into another framework in which I didn't have the manifold, an algebraic field framework. Um, if that works, then there's a way of doing the dynamical approach, which in fact didn't presuppose manifold structure to start off with at all. Um, and so that would be a more positive reaction to Norton to say, fair enough, uh, we would really like to get rid of this, but in fact, we can do it. So either you say like Pooley, that was never part of the project. I think that's fair enough. Or you say, all right, I'm gonna take Norton's challenge by the horns and try and get rid of this thing as well. Um, and it seems like proponents of the dynamical view have made some progress there in recent times. So I guess what I would want to say uh, is in that in light of the recent writings of people like Pooley and Stevens and Menon, it's not clear whether Norton's challenges against the dynamical approach actually find their mark. Cool. Uh, any quick questions at this point? All right, I will, I will carry on for now. Oh, in fact, no, this was my, this was my uh, point to stop anyway. So maybe, maybe if this is all right, Nick, we should take a quick break here. Yeah, no, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Um, so, I mean, do, do people have more questions about where we've got so far? Um, otherwise we could take a break and, and maybe, you know, we can start again with people who sort of think about questions. Um, yeah, so I'm, Casper, we've only been going, we haven't been going for an hour yet. So Casper says he has a question, but do you want to ask now? Oh. Or? Go on, Casper, ask now. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm just wondering on this um, account of the dynamical approach in which we assume the manifolds. Yeah. Um, couldn't another way to answer Norton's challenge be to say that we're not even going to assume topological structure? We're just mm -hmm. going to assume a bare set of points mm -hmm. and, and then do the same thing and say, well, some ways of coordinating this set of points is going to yield to very elegant and simple laws. Those coordinatizations happen to endow this set of points with topological structure. So in that sense, topological structure, like metrical structure, sort of emerges from these um, facts about laws. Yeah, so the idea would be to take your subvening base to be, ev to be even weaker than a manifold, to be as weak as you possibly can. Right, and then you could say, well, that's, that's definitely not space-time. So it wouldn't phase Norton's challenge. We've just assumed some sort of set of entities. Yeah, so there's actually some nice discussion of this in Simon Stevens' work, so I'd recommend this. Um, he says that, in principle, this can work. But the weaker you take your subvening base to be, the less obvious is it is that you're going to recover what you were after to start off with. Um, right. There might be other simplest and strongest codifications of what's going on if you start off with just such a weak subvening base. So I think in principle it can work, but we would probably need to work through the details and see what we end up with. Cool. Thanks. I, I, I don't know. I talk a bit yeah. about this. I mean, my paper is more talk, is thinking about kind of, you know, Leibnizian sort of particle, you know, point particle kind of relationism rather than fields. Um, but there is, I do discuss the topology in that sort of way for particles as well. And there I'm kind of imagining having a load of relations and trying to embed them in different topologies. Um, 
but it does come but you know there there is a, i do a, a sort of acknowledge that there's going to be the possibility of sort of under determination sort of equally good best systems and then i just suggest biting the bullet that in fact this topological fact is sort of it's not factual it's just an un, it's under undetermined which you know what the topology is or whether there's a hole in space time here or not is just undetermined and that's not so bad for the Humean, of course, because, you know, if, say that, you know, if it's undetermined, say whether there's a hole in some region of space time or not, by the whole Humean mosaic, then it certainly follows that no one ever does anything in the whole history of the universe to see if there's a hole there. So it's not like one could refute this, because you have to remember the mosaic is extended in time as well as, as well as space. So, um, yeah, you have kind of a bit more than you thought. And I think I did suggest there, and I seem to remember um, Ollie brings this up in some of his papers as well, that maybe the, what you kind of want to be starting with, right, is sort of point coincidences, see, see where you can go. And I guess that's Simon's idea as well. Is, is that about yeah. right? I think so. Yeah, there's lots of interest. I think, yeah, you're absolutely right, Casper, that this is a kind of third avenue for this. You, there's, I think the questions about underdetermination are really interesting. Um, but I agree with Nick that it's not obvious that you can't get around them. Um, so. Yeah, and another way that you might reply to Norton on behalf of the dynamical view. I don't know if, so, sorry, Nick, were you going to say something? I was, but it was on another point. Okay, so I was go just going to say, um, so I don't want to put you on the spot, Niels, but you also have a paper on this, right? So. <laughs> Uh, yes, but it's still in progress. I uh, don't have much to add here at this point. Um, Fine. Also, But, I, but basically, quickly, I, I share what Casper says to some degree, yes. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, Nick. Yeah, what were, what were you going to say then? Yeah, and I certainly don't want to take over just the questions. So if other people have questions, I'm very happy to just be quiet. And, um, you know, we've had a chance to talk about this um, at other times. So I was just going to say, you know, about um, Tushar Menon's um, algebraic approach, you know, one thing I would note about that is, you know, when you move to the algebraic approach, you're looking now at the algebra of the fields that live in the space. Um, and I, I take it the idea is then, you know, a point is uh, and a maximal ideal of that algebra. So, but that algebra kind of is an algebra of all the possible fields. And mm -hmm. so this, it is reproducing something you quite often see in a sort of substantivalist relationist debate is the sub relationist will trade off substantivalist about substantivalism about space time um, in favor of um, some pretty strong kind of modal structure about how things, ha you know, what relations are possible. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me something similar is going on in the algebraic account because it is to do with what fields are possible. And that is sort of the structure. And you do sort of see that that interplay. Yeah. I, if I recall rightly, Shamik Desgupta has some critiques of the algebraic approaches on these lines as well. OK, yeah. So um, as Nick said, uh, everything that I've talked about up to this point has been about theories with fixed space time structure like uh, Newtonian mechanics or special relativity in which the space-time structure is fixed once and for all. It's kind of a background object in which physical events to do with matter unfold. Um, obviously that changes very much uh, in general relativity um, where space-time becomes a dynamical entity unto itself which is coupled to matter via, via the Einstein field equations. Um, and it turns out that that change also precipitates a change in how the dynamical approach um, and its opponents play out. So it's that stuff that I want to talk about in the second half of the talk. So like I said, space-time in general relativity is dynamical. Its evolution is governed by the Einstein field equations, which effectively say that curvature of space-time uh, is coupled to the matter content of space-time via the stress energy tensor. Um, now in light of this, Brown says, that there's no substantial conceptual distinction anymore between space-time and in particular the metric field of general relativity um, and matter fields. Whereas before there was this conception between this distinction between the inert background and then the matter which actually does stuff. Now everything does stuff 
And so you can't say that there's this clear cut distinction between the two. What he writes is this, gravity is different from the other interactions. So he's talking about gravity as being represented by the metric field. But this doesn't mean that it's categorically distinct from say the electromagnetic field. Um, there doesn't seem to be as clear cut a conceptual distinction between uh, these kinds of objects in general relativity anymore. Now, here I think the terminology gets quite confusing, and so I want to warn you about this. So in this sense, in which Brown does not think that there's a deep conceptual distinction between the metric field of general relativity and the matter content, you might count him as a relationalist. Um, in that sense, Brown would count someone like Ravelli as an ally who says similar things. But I want to flag that this notion of relationalism is kind of different from the one that we've been talking about up to this point. So caution is needed. It's a different notion. Uh, when you say that, you're not necessarily saying that you want to ontologically excise or reduce that metric field. You're just saying it has the same conceptual status as matter fields. Um, and so there's a bit of ambiguity about what relationalism means here. Sure, Brown is a relationalist in the sense that he thinks that matter is in the same kind of conceptual class as the metric field in GR. Um, but he's not a relationalist yet in the sense that he wants to reduce the metric field to properties of matter fields. Um, in fact, this is like a major divergence or difference in the views of Brown in the context of theories like special relativity and his views in the context of theories like general relativity. In general relativity, Brown, in fact, doesn't make a claim that the metric field should be ontologically reduced to properties of the laws governing meta fields. Uh, he says that it he says that it cries out for reification because it's dynamical. Um, and so Brown is effectively reneging on that first ontological reduction part of his view when it comes to theories with dynamical spacetime like general relativity. So that first point was to apply to fixed spacetime structure like the Minkowski metric field, but not to dynamical structure like the metric field of general relativity. I think the best thing to say here is that Brown is a relationalist in the context of special relativity and not a relationalist in the context of general relativity. And this new use of relationalism, for me at least, kind of muddies the waters. So I would just kind of flag that for you and kind of advise some caution when you're reading passages here. Um, but regardless of Brown's own views, uh, you might wonder about whether the entire dynamical package can be carried across to general relativity, even if Brown doesn't want to stick by point one of those two points which characterize the dynamical view. Could you stick by it? Could you somehow, in some way to be articulated, ontologically reduced the metric field of general relativity to properties of matter fields, maybe by undertaking some kind of generalization of the regularity relationalist project? I think that's an interesting question, um, especially interesting because no one's actually answered it very well up to this point. So this is uh, one of the areas that I would definitely flag for uh, ways in which you could contribute to these debates if you're interested. Um, the reason why people haven't done it so far is that it's kind of hard. So if I try and be a regularity relationalist about general relativity, well, it's not obvious how that's gonna work. The reason being that uh, regularity relationalism relies on there being a privileged class of coordinate systems in which the dynamical laws take a simple form. Um, but given the diffeomorphism invariance of general relativity, the fact that the dynamical equations like Einstein's equations are invariant under all smooth but otherwise arbitrary coordinate transformations, uh, such a coordinate system doesn't seem to exist. I don't seem to have the symmetries uh, which regularity relationalism can piggyback on. Um, now, maybe here's a way in. Uh, and I've already talked about this a little bit, and I'm going to talk about it more later. It is true that in general relativity, you do recover locally privileged coordinate systems. Very roughly speaking, locally, the dynamics governing matter takes a special relativistic form. Locally, the metric field reduces to something like the Minkowski metric. So if you could somehow start off with the local stuff and build back up, the metric field, maybe this would be a way in uh, to getting this kind of project off the ground. But no one has done it yet. Uh, so, like I said, here's an opportunity for you if you're interested to make a contribution. Um, it would be interesting to see whether we can get the full dynamical view through uh, in general relativity. James, can I just 
Hasn't Tushar been doing something along those lines? I should flag, yeah. So Tushar is working on this hard. Uh, and I've been, uh, so we're, we're doing this together. Um, Tushar's put much more effort into it than I have. And we're making some progress, but I think there's still things to be ironed out. There's technical fiddliness, which I think both of us are not yet happy with. Uh, and so, you know, maybe we'll get there first, but maybe if you're really fast, you'll beat us to it. Uh, I still think that, I, I mean, I stick by that no one has done it fully satisfactorily yet, although I profess to be working on it myself with Tushar. But I should advertise, yeah, so Tushar has given some really good talks on how you might get this through recently, and perhaps many of you have been to those. Good. Um, so, we would like, ideally, to get both of the aspects of the dynamical view going in the context of GR. But let's suppose that we side with Brown uh, we, when we look at the last chapter of his book where he explicitly reneges on the first of those points. Um, one thing you might ask is what remains of the difference between the dynamical and geometrical view if the dynamical approach, if a proponent of the dynamical view like Brown doesn't buy into that first point anymore. So recall that we had these two points which characterize the dynamical view. The first space-time structure is to be reduced to dynamical symmetries. The second is that no piece of geometrical structure has its chronogeometric significance necessarily. Well, when it comes to two, really all parties should assent to it. And I kind of mentioned this earlier when I was talking about the qualified geometrical approach. And I said that they should just assent to the fact that sometimes your piece of structure might not qualify as operational space-time. It might not always be that matter fields read off intervals of this given piece of structure. To say that is basically to be accepting point two, that it's not necessarily the case that my designated piece of structure is surveyed by matter. So if all parties should assent to two, and if the proponent of the dynamical view is no longer advocating a novel form of ontological reduction of the metric field a la one, um, I think it's reasonable to ask, yeah, what is left of the difference? Um, and a lot of, well, a few people have yeah, picked up on this. I think the first person to pick up on it was Oliver Pooley, who basically said, if the proponent of the dynamical view gets rid of point one here, uh, then there's really not much left of the difference between the dynamical view and what I've been calling the qualified geometrical view. Um, so here's Pooley's quote on this. Uh, here he is talking about the difference between the dynamical and geometrical views, although he has put things in terms of the language of substantivalism and relationalism here. Um, but let me just read it out. He writes, what then is at stake between the metric reifying relationalist and the traditional substantivalist? Both parties accept the existence of a substantival entity whose structural properties are characterized mathematically by a pseudo Riemannian metric field and whose co connection to the behavior of material rods and clocks depends on inter alia facts about the dynamics of matter. It's hard to resist the suspicion that this corner of the debate is becoming merely terminological. Uh, if in the context of GR, both parties are not accepting one, accepting two, what's left of the difference between them? A reasonable question to ask, I think. Um, in that sense, then, you might think that this whole debate kind of collapses in general relativity unless we can push forward with one, which proves us, I think, extra motivation to undertake this project of trying to extend regularity relationalism to the GR context. Um, just a quick pause in case anyone has questions here. Cool. Okay, let's carry on then. All right, so I haven't really talked about this point two that much so far. This point that no designated piece of structure necessarily has chronogeometric significance, which means that no piece of geometric structure is necessarily surveyed by matter. That's what we mean by chronogeometric significance. Um, there are questions regarding how exactly the metric field of general relativity does acquire its chronogeometric significance. Um, and this is something which Brown talks about in the last chapter of his book and which uh, many papers have been written about in recent years. Brown's answer to this question of how it is that the metric field of GR acquires its chronogeometric significance is this. He writes, chronogeometrical significance of the metric field is not an intrinsic feature of the gravitational dynamics, that's his two, uh, but earns its spurs by way of the strong equivalence principle. 
Now, I haven't talked about the strong equivalence principle by this name yet, um, but I have mentioned it content. It says that locally, matter takes a special relativistic form. For Brown, the fact that locally the dynamics governing matter takes a special relativistic form is a crucial component in that matter reading off intervals as given by the metric field. So just to flag, the strong equivalence principle is a particularly delicate issue. Uh, how one poses it is really sensitive to whether, for example, one is talking about points or neighborhoods, um, whether one is talking about special relativistic form as meaning Poincaré invariant form or meaning no curvature couplings. Uh, completely being precise about all of these things is yeah, very delicate. Uh, Harvey Brown and Dennis Lemkul and I try to be careful about some of these things in this 2018 paper, although people are still a bit concerned that it is not sufficiently mathematically precise. Um, so for example, there's this paper by Weatherall, which has just come out on the FieldSci archive, which is saying that more needs to be done to render this SEP mathematically precise. Uh, I think Weatherall is right there, um, but I think that the SEP is still kind of morally correct. Uh, it seems to be true that locally special general relativistic dynamics recovers its special relativistic form. And indeed, it seems to be empirically true as well. Like I can use special relativity to model local goings on. I don't need to appeal to the full machinery of general relativity to do that. Um, but we would still like to be more mathematically precise about it. And in that sense, I think uh, whether all is right. Um, I'll talk about that more later. Let's just for the moment take the SEP as saying locally in, special, in general relativity, our dynamics recovers a special relativistic form. Then Brown's argument for why or how it is that the SEP, the strong equivalence principle, is important for the metric field acquiring chronogeometric significance can be posed like this. It's a four point argument. So by the strong equivalence principle, Dynamical laws governing matter fields take locally a Poincaré invariant, i.e. special relativistic form. By the existence of Riemann normal coordinates, which basically say that at any point in the manifold, I can diagonalize the metric field and its first derivatives vanish, uh, the metric field of general relativity takes locally a, lo a Minkowskian form. Therefore, by these first two points, the dynamical symmetries, which are locally Poincaré invariant, coincide with the metric symmetries because I've got a metric field in the form minus one, 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 and that's going to be preserved under Poincaré symmetries. Therefore, the metric field, at least locally, comes to acquire its chronogeometric significance. Now, if you're puzzling about that fourth point, I think that's totally legit, and I'm going to come back to this. Uh, so there are in, indeed a number of concerns that you might have about this particular argument. Um, the first is what I just mentioned, that the first two points about this idea of local symmetries isn't sufficiently well-defined. The idea of the strong equivalence principle isn't sufficiently mathematically precise. Um, Weatherall critiques this in this 2020 paper. Another good discussion of this, which tries to make things more precise is a recent paper by Slam, Sam Fletcher called uh, Approximate Local Poincaré Symmetries, which I would recommend. Uh, another problem that you might have is that the inference from the first three steps to the fourth step is too fast. Just because symmetries coincide doesn't necessarily mean that there are rods and clocks which will read off intervals even locally. Uh, to use some of the terminology from before, the fact that some piece of structure qualifies as theoretical space-time, uh, it coincides with the symmetries of the dynamical laws, or its symmetries coincide with the symmetries of the dynamical laws, doesn't necessarily mean that it qualifies as operational space-time, doesn't necessarily mean that there are rods and clocks which will actually read off its intervals. And something similar is, or, some, or something to do with this distinction is going on here. Brown, uh, assuming that this argument is faithful to him, which I think it is, it seems to be assuming that the fact that we locally find that the metric field qualifies as theoretical space-time means that it qualifies as operational space-time. Um, but I think that's just too fast. This move to four is too fast, absent further details. Um, another point which uh, Niels Linneman and I have been looking into recently uh, is this. 
there seem to be other accounts of how the metric field of general relativity could acquire its chronogeometric significance. One of the most notable in the history or in the historical philosophy of space-time literature uh, is the appeal to the constructive axiomatic scheme of Euler's Peranian shield from 1972. And effectively what they showed is if I know the trajectories of uh, massless and massive particles, so I say take some marbles and I throw them and I shine some torches, I should be able to back reconstruct what the metric is. Uh, and they show this in elaborate detail. It's a very, very beautiful paper. Um, there are concerns about whether it's right or not, whether it's circular or not. Um, so for example, one thing that people say is that it presupposes that we know what the free particles are, but how could I do that without some prior standard of uh, inertial motion given by space-time? And so I can't be correct properly operationalizing space-time. Uh, I have to already know what space-time is to get this off the ground. That would be the kind of concern. Um, there have been responses on behalf of Ehlers Baranian Shield, but at least on the face of it, this seems to be another way of figuring out what the metric structure of space-time is, which doesn't proceed by, by the strong equivalence principle, um, and which seems to be somewhat mathematically cleaner, you might think. Um, and so that's not so much a direct critique of this argument, but more a question of kind of why bother when there's better routes available. So, um, there's definitely more to say on behalf of the dynamical view to explain why the SEP is playing a crucial role in the metric field of general relativity, playing its geometric significance. Um, another autobiographical remark, I used to think that it was very important, but I'm increasingly kind of persuaded by these criticisms that it's not as important as uh, say you might get the impression that it is from the last from the last chapter of Brown's book. Regardless of that, um, another interesting question is what the conceptual status of the strong equivalence principle is. Um, so is this something which we get for free in general relativity or is it something which is kind of an additional input assumption in the theory? Well if I start off with general relativity being the stipulation that I have uh, a manifold and I have a Lorentzian metric field living on that manifold and the dynamics of that Lorentzian metric is governed by the Einstein field equations. Just with those details, uh, it could still be the case that I have matter fields which obey different dynamical symmetries, which have different dynamical laws, um, and which in, in particular don't satisfy the strong equivalence principle. So you can imagine some dynamical laws which are locally Galilean invariant rather than locally Poincaré invariant. There's nothing to stop you having that in general relativity conceived of in this way. And so if I want the strong equivalence principle, I have to interpret it as being an extra input assumption in the theory. Uh, I stipulate that my dynamical laws governing matter fields have this property. Uh, it's an extra ingredient that I have to put in. Um, but then that opens the question of, well, okay, I might not be able to get it for free from the conceptual structure of general relativity, but maybe it is the case that I can somehow derive the strong equivalence principle by looking to some successor theory to general relativity. This would be somewhat akin to its being coincidental in Newtonian mechanics that gravitational mass is equal to, to inertial mass, um, that this mg in Newton's law of gravitation is equal to the constant of proportionality in Newton's second law, something which is just an input assumption in Newtonian mechanics. Um, but we can explain that by looking to some successor theory of Newtonian mechanics, uh, perhaps general relativity. And indeed, uh, in a 2011 paper, Weatherall has quite a nice discussion about how uh, I can look to general relativity to attempt to derive the coincidence of gravitational and inertial mass, something which seemed like an extra input assumption in Newtonian mechanics. So the thought here would be something similar. I had to stick in the strong equivalence principle into the framework of general relativity. Um, but maybe it's the case that it falls out of some successor theory to general relativity. Just to flag two recent attempts to answer this, so uh, I tried to show that constraints given from perturbative string theory, uh, where you start off with an ontology of strings and then uh, the machinery of these strings eventually gives you what all of the equations for background fields on space-time are, not only the Einstein field equations, plus corrections, 
uh, but also the dynamics of matter and gives you the symmetries of all of them at once. Um, that would give us the strong equivalence principle. There's no way that the symmetries of the metric could come apart from the dynamical symmetries. Um, you might think though, so I think that's, I think I stick by that that's right, that you can derive the strong equivalence principle um, by looking to this particular successor theory. Um, maybe it's overkill. So in a very nice recent paper by Kian Salim Khani, who, which should be coming out online very, very soon in studies in history and philosophy of modern physics. Um, he shows if I look at classical or quantum spin two theories of gravity, um, classical spin two theories being an alternative formulation of uh, general relativity, which starts off with a fixed Minkowski background and then has uh, spin two fields living on that background and quantum versions being the quantized versions of those. Um, some work um, by physicists and maybe 20 or 30 years ago uh, allows us to derive the strong equivalence principle. Um, and so that's also a really interesting result where I'm not exactly looking to general relativity, but I'm looking to either a successor theory or to some reformulation of the theory in an attempt to derive this result, which otherwise looked like an input assumption in the theory. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes out, um, I would uh, recommend this paper in particular. Okay, so summarize this section then. Um, so what we've seen so far is that Brown, perhaps surprisingly, when you first read that last, sec last chapter of his book on general relativity, reneges on the relationalist project. He thinks that this relationalist project applies only to fixed pieces of space-time structure, but not to dynamical pieces of space-time structure. This, however, leads to a worry that there's no clear distinction between the dynamical and geometrical approaches uh, in the context of general relativity. Uh, and this concern was raised by, for example, Pooley. Um, we have also flagged though, that there is opportunity for someone to follow through with the regularity relationalist version of um, the dynamical approach in the dynamical space-time context. Uh, the next point, Hal Brown has argued that the chronogeometric significance uh, of the metric field in general relativity is inherited by the SEP. We've seen that. Um, but there are concerns about this line of reasoning. Um, people might say the SEP is not well defined. They might say the SEP is actually redundant because you need to assume the existence of rods and clocks which read off intervals of the metric field anyway. Uh, or you might think there are just better ways to go. Um, we've seen that explaining the strong equivalence principle might require appeal to some deeper theory. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about today is how Brown's views overlap with um, the views of her, his previous student, now professor in London, Eleanor Knox, her views being space-time functionalism. Um, but I'll pause for discussion here, especially as this last topic is a little bit different. So does anyone have any questions about these points? Uh, I guess, uh, James, I have a question just about the best way to understand chronogeometric significance. Yep. Is it supposed to be understood as a dispositional property of the metric field in the sense that the metric field is disposed to be surveyed in this way by rats and clocks? Mm, I don't think so. I think it's meant to be more just a fact. So if there exists, an, or an existence claim, so if there exist rods and clocks, let's just focus on clocks, whose ticks read off intervals of proper time along their world lines as given by the metric field, then the metric field has chrono significance there. Uh, and if there, are if there are rods which uh, correctly read off intervals, spatial intervals as given by the metric, then it has geometric significance. It has both, it has chrono geometric significance. And it, and it would have that significance even if it's just in a local patch of space time. So if there was just one region of space time that had chrono significance, there could be other patches of space time that don't have chrono yeah. significance. Yeah, so that's a possibility as well. It might be that it has chrono geometric significance in a region, but not globally. So it does like, to, uh, to ascribe chronogeometric significance to the metric, it doesn't have to be counterfactually robust? Uh, I don't think so, no. Not on Brown's okay, cool. Um, yeah, um, and Brown is saying, so his, again, straw man version of the geometrical view would say that the metric field necessarily has chronogeometric significance uh, in virtue of somehow the metric compelling rods and clocks to survey it. He says that's false, and I think that's totally right, but I don't think that many people actually hold that view. Uh, I think, in fact, 
uh, like I said before, all parties would agree that whether this is true depends upon, you know, what you can do with rods and clogs. Uh, cool. Thanks, Jess. There's also a distinction between, um, or this is a distinction which Pooley likes to draw between chronogeometric significance, which he takes to be specifically associated with rods and clocks and whether they survey the metric field versus just operational significance. So suppose it's the case that uh, the Ehlers Pirani shield um, operationalization of the metric field works, but I don't have any stable macroscopic rods and clocks then you might want to say that the metric field has operational significance because I can survey it using massless, massive and massless particles, but it doesn't have chronogeometric significance because rods and clocks don't, um, there are no rods and clocks to survey it. That's a distinction that you might draw. I think, fair enough, it's a bit fine grained, so I was kind of eliding it, um, but it's something that you might want to say. Different ways of accessing the metric field. Cool. Did anyone else want to ask anything? Okay, so my last section then is about space-time functionalism. So here's Eleanor Knox, um, and here's her view, uh, which she nicely summarizes in her 2019 paper, which is in fact in a collection of articles in studies in history and philosophy of modern physics, which is dedicated to Brown's work. And all of those articles are really good, so I'd recommend them. Um, Knox writes, I propose that the space-time role is played by whatever defines the structure of local inertial frames. The idea here is this, and this we can take this sentence to effectively capture her idea of space-time functionalism. The idea is this, so space-time is to be defined as whatever plays the antecedently designated role of space-time, and for her, that is this role, picking out a structure of local inertial frames. Uh, what this means uh, is for the structure to pick out the symmetries of the dynamical laws governing matter. Um, and so effectively for the structure to qualify as theoretical space-time in the language which I've been using for its symmetries to pick out the symmetries of the dynamical laws. So yeah, whatever you make of this, um, and indeed there have been some critical there has been some critical discussion lately in Eleanor's own special issue dedicated to her, which is in Synthesa. Uh, so um, just to say a little bit here. So for example, Baker criticizes Eleanor Knox's space-time functionalism on the ground that he doesn't think that picking out uh, inertial structure is the sine qua non of spatiotemporality. In fact, he presents a long list of properties that you might associate with space-time. And he says that uh, space-time should be understood as a cluster concept where I just need sufficiently many of these things to be satisfied for that object to be identified as space-time. So he's not necessarily disagreeing with the idea of functionalism so much as the specific conception of functionalism associated with inertial frames that Knox has. Um, and then in this paper uh, with Tushar, I say that the way that Knox sometimes writes makes one have the impression that she's after operational space-time, the thing which is actually read off by rods and clocks, but her inertial frame space-time functionalism only gives theoretical space-time, and as we've seen, there's already a gap between the two. Um, so it doesn't necessarily realize on the ambitions that she had. Um, so yeah, uh, these are two critical papers. Um, but the thing that I wanna to flag today is that this view is clearly different from the dynamical approach. Um, in the literature, one sometimes sees Knox's views as presented as being um, a natural development of the dynamical approach or the dynamical approach rendered comprehensible or something like that. Uh, but I think uh, this is a bit too fast. Uh, it's, it maybe evolves out of it, but it is definitely distinct. Uh, and we can see this by just looking at these points. So Brown isn't really interested in defining space time. In fact, I'm not sure if he said this in print, but if you speak to him in person, he'll say, I'm just not interested in the definition of space-time. Uh, he's in, interested in one, this novel form of ontological reduction, which we've been talking about a lot, and in two, whether and when a piece of structure has chronogeometric significance. And both of those are distinct from choosing to define space-time in this functional way a la Locke's. Um, so, uh, though related, especially to the second point, because Knox's ambitions for when to define space-time have to do with chronogeometric significance. 
the project is clearly distinct from these things. Um, so let me just wrap up and then, in fact, I think we're going to have more time for discussion than I thought. Uh, so I've tried to present to you the various threads of the dynamical approach um, and tease them out. So just to summarize the main ideas. So we first of all seen that the dynamical approach as a program of ontological reduction uh, is perhaps best understood as a form of Huggett's regularity relationalism. Um, we've thought about Brown's critiques of the geometrical approach, and we've seen that maybe some of them are a bit too fast. If we distinguish between the qualified and unqualified geometrical approaches, um, then the qualified geometrical approach actually seems to be totally fine. Uh, moreover, we've seen different senses in which space-time might be explanatory on the qualified geometrical approach. Uh, whether it's constructively explanatory presupposes substantivalism, but even if you don't buy into substantivalism as a proponent of the geometrical view, you can still think that space-time explains facts about the dynamics in other ways, maybe unificatory ways, maybe structuralist ways. We've seen Norton's challenge, and we've seen some responses on behalf of the dynamical approach to that. Then in the context of general relativity, we've seen that Brown reneges on the ontological reduction aspect, um, but one might still want to follow through with it in order for there to still be a distinction between the dynamical and geometrical approaches there. Um, but we've seen the prima facie problems to do with the general covariance of general relativity, it's diffeomorphism and variance. Um, not to say that the project can't be done, but we just haven't done it yet. Um, we've thought about the different ways in which the metric field of general relativity might be said to acquire its chronogeometric significance. Brown points to the strong equivalence principle as being a crucial component there. Um, but things are a bit delicate and it's not obvious that the strong equivalence principle gives you everything that you might want. Um, and finally, we've seen something of the difference between space-time functionalism a la Knox uh, and the dynamical approach to space-time theories. Um, definitely space-time functionalism can trace its origins in a fairly obvious way to the dynamical approach, um, but the ambitions seem to be different. Um, I've talked about a number of things which have yet to be done, uh, so I'll write this quick to-do list. Uh, and as Nick has already flagged, uh, I'm trying to do the first one uh, with Tushar. So first, uh, extend the ontological reduction of the dynamical approach to GR. Uh, second, articulate the strong equivalence principle with a sufficient level of mathematical precision uh, to satisfy uh, authors such as Weatherall. Um, if you want to see his critiques, uh, have a look at his 2020 paper. Um, and third, uh, explore systematically the different ways in which the metric field of general relativity might be said to acquire its chronogeometric significance. So I've started working on this last one a little bit recently with Niels Linneman by looking in more detail at these ehlers borani shields type constructive axiomatizations. Um, in fact, there's kind of a rich body of physics literature which has been broadly ignored in the philosophy of physics. So I think there's a lot to be done here as well. Um, cool, uh, I've got a long list of references if anyone is interested uh, and I am very much looking forward to having a discussion. So thanks all for paying attention. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, but let's take questions for, you know, that people have now. Um, and then, you know, in a bit we can sort of break if people want to stay around and just chat a little more informally. I'll, I'll leave it recording and on YouTube for now and we can have a more informal chat sort of in a bit. So, well, let me invite questions on sort of any of this or anything else other people want to ask James. Uh, yeah, James, uh, I have a question. I think it goes back to Jeremy's question about ontological reduction. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm still, I'm still not totally clear on the sense in which we're ontologically reducing the metric field on the regularity relational sub count. So I could like, from a Humean standpoint, like best system account of laws, mm -hmm. yeah, I could understand how we would view the symmetries that the metric field transforms under as codified by regularities in the Hemian mosaic. And so in that sense, I can understand how we would ontologically reduce or show to be derivative the symmetries of the metric field. Mm -hmm. I cannot get my head around the regularity notion of actually ontologically reducing the metric field where the metric field is viewed as like a thing in the world. Um, 
what are we reducing that to? Just other things in the human mosaic? Yeah, so the laws are derivative on the mosaic and space-time structure is derivative on certain facts about the laws, namely their symmetries. Um, Which is ultimately derivative of the facts on the mosaic. Yeah, but yeah, does, does this not satisfy you? I, I guess it's like, I've never thought about the best system account as being able to ontologically reduce things to laws because the laws aren't things on the best system account. The laws like aren't ontological entities. The laws are just codifications of things about the mosaic. So I find the terminology kind of confusing, I guess. Well, maybe a better way to put it is that you kind of get the laws and space time out of the mosaic more directly rather than taking, because you're absolutely right that on the best system account, the laws aren't like things in the world anyway. Uh, so it, is it, I see what you and Jeremy mean if your concern is, well, how am I reducing this space-time structure to this other thing which itself doesn't really exist in the world? Uh, yeah. I think it's better to, it's probably, that's the language that the dynamical approach proponents often use, but I think you're both right. That it's probably better just start off with them as they can take both of them to emerge directly. Okay, cool. Thanks, James. Is that the way that you are seeing it, Nick? Just to check that I'm not misrepresenting the view. I mean, picking up on what you know Josh was saying, right? The way you're making it sound like it sound is as if you know the metric field is a physical field on the, you know this is the Minkowski case, say, on a par with the other fields that are in the space time. Um, I take it that's what um, Josh is sort of objecting to, and I guess I would think of it more of an elimination of the metric field or something. It's showing that the metric field is really, you know, it's a not useful mathematical device for sort of describing the laws. It's nice that we can kind of cast it in this geometric way, but I don't need any metric field to write down my law, which is, you know, this is what the, there are frames in which the equations of motion look like this. And I, that, that's sort of an elimination rather than a reduction in that sense. Yeah, and maybe that's, that's what he yeah. was getting at. Cool. That, I mean, that's totally fine. I would be happy to call it elimination as well, if that would make you guys happier. I mean, it, and it sounds better, actually. Uh, Jeremy, you have a hand up. Yeah, just a very quick figure on this point. Um, uh, th this has helped uh, uh, clarify my worry quite a bit. Um, I also wanted to note that I realized part of my confusion had to do with the use of the term explanation. Um, so, so I was confused by talk of the dynamical approach using the symmetries of the laws to explain um, the metric structure, um, give, given just as, as Josh and, and Nick were just saying, that, and, yeah. and you, that, that it's not something, it's not an entity out in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. Uh, part of the issue here is that these things were maybe not so clear in 2001 when people were starting to talk about these things, and so they were maybe using terms which retrospectively we think are not maximally clear. Um, yeah. Cool. But thanks, yeah, this is really useful. Um, um, I see a question from Tom, I think. Okay, thank you for meeting myself. Um, hi James, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, it's very clear, uh, very interesting. I was just interested in some of your remarks about um, the, um, what is it, Ehlers Shield Pirani um, yeah. reconstruction. I mean, one of the things that seems interesting to me there is that arguably, um, in terms of your uh, chronogeometric significance, if you've reconstructed the, the metric in terms of um, basically the paths of material particles and um, the uh, the clocks that they carry, which are used to sort of time signals and responses from other material particles. So you've just got material particles, light signals, and clocks. Um, I was just curious about what you thought about the claim that then what you've done is um, reduced the the metric to the behaviour of clocks rather than clocks and rods because where the rods appear in the um 
in the reconstruction? Um, so I think it would be fine to say that you have operationalized the metric there in terms of just well, without appeal to rods. And I think that a number of authors in the literature, in fact, do say this. In fact, so I, I is it, so I'm pretty sure Penrose says this. Uh, I think, oh, since, but I don't want to misspeak. Um, they both say that uh, there's a sense in which rods are a lot as important as clocks when it comes to operationalizing the metric field. Um, that sounds right to me. I mean, it, but then it, it, it seems interesting to me that 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 seems to sort of undercut the original idea that we're looking at the dynamics of something. If we're just um, so rather than looking at the dynamics of matter, we're sort of saying, well, um, particles following these trajectories and um, bouncing signals back off one another. Um, you know, is that is that a dynamics of anything? I guess you're getting a history rather than a dynamics of a particular um, dynamical history. Sorry, I'm, I'm just, I just that thought occurred to me, and I, I wanted to uh, see what you had to say about it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, maybe it's worth just saying again that in the GR context, Brown is not seeking to reduce the metric to dynamics. So. Yes, yes. And I think you would be willing to, you'd be perfectly happy with there being different in principle ways in which you can get operational access to the metric field. And maybe, yeah, rods turn out to be less useful than we previously thought them to be. Uh, if one could, you know, maybe appeal to the EPS construction to show that, then I, I don't see why Brown would have a problem with that. Um, yeah, yeah, no, you did make that point. Um, okay, yeah, thanks. thanks. I won't. Question okay, sorry. Any more questions? I have a couple, but I would really invite other people. Um, I had they started cutting metal bars up outside my window, so I just had to go shut it. Um, yeah, so a couple of things. So, could you clarify? I'll, could you clarify your view or your attitude about qualified, you know, the qualified geometry position. Mm -hmm. I think on the slide you used a word like saying it was legitimate, which sure. doesn't quite sound like you endorse it or think it's equally good. Is, is that what you think? Or do you think there are other arguments that now kind of come into play? I think it works. Uh, I, I, well, in the context of theories with fixed space time structure, I think it works and I think there's more going for a geometrical view than maybe proponents of the dynamical view have previously given the geometrical view credit for. Um, my inclination is to still favor the dynamical approach, basically on ontologically, ontological parsimony grounds, if I have a nice story to tell about how I can get rid of the metric field, uh, then, well, I don't need it, so I may as well get rid of it. Um, and that's partly motivated by empiricist considerations as well, that, you know, I, I can see and interact with material bodies, but it doesn't seem like I can see and interact with the Minkowski metric. So I would like to get rid of it if I can. And it seems like the dynamical approach gives me a way of doing that. Um, and so uh, even though the geometrical approach isn't kind of dead in the water as you might have thought it was, I still think that the dynamical approach has some advantages. So, you know, from talking to, you know, Harvey Brown over the, about, this I, I took his attitude was maybe that he had a sort of narrow, narrower view about what a constructive explanation sort of mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Namely, look, real, real physical explanations are always in terms of the interactions of matter. So it's always going to come down to the laws and the forces. I mean, maybe we'll learn the world is totally different, but the way we sort of understand how to explain things um, physically, it's in terms of you know matter and the interactions of matter. It's you know, a bit Cartesian or something in, in that way. And if you start trying to explain things in you know geometrical terms, you've just kind of left the physical boat, and so that those aren't really good explanations. And so there's a narrower kind of view of what a constructive explanation is that it really involves dynamical laws and the interactions of matter. And what he's done is show that 
that's really enough where you might not have thought it was. Yeah, I think I see where he's coming from. I think it's still a bit. I mean, maybe I'm I'm reading too much. It, that's how I understood him. So uh, you know, he's not here to say. But that that and that's what I kind of liked about the views. So you can you can blame it on me if you want. No, I think that I think that's that is very similar. That's definitely um, representative of how Graham is thinking. I just so imagine like the Klein Gordon equation written in a coordinate independent way. Um, I don't know. It's like. Maybe it's not worth sharing, sharing my whiteboard, but I think people know what this looks like. So the Minkowski metric derivatives of phi is equal to zero. Uh, I mean, there's a sense in which you could say, if I believe that the Minkowski metric there is something real, then look, this thing is coupled to the phi field in this equation. And so I can use this thing to explain certain properties of the behavior of phi. Uh, now that doesn't seem so removed from the kind of physical interaction account that Brown is giving, unless one adds, that adds extra qualifications like mm, the Minkowski metric isn't tangible like physical matter or something like that. So this isn't a good good type of physical interaction. Um, well, it's not dynamical. It, it, there's no back reaction. You know that's what he's going to say, right? So that's really the problem. That's the fundamental problem with it. Yeah, so stuff with no back reaction. There is no real interaction Yeah, so things which do not, so Brown talks a lot about the action reaction principle and his problem with things like the Minkowski metric field is that it seems to violate this principle because uh, there is no back reaction on the Minkowski metric field, unlike say the metric field of general relativity. Um, and so you can't appeal to it in the same kinds of physical accounts as say the metric field of general relativity. And so we have uh, reasons to want to get rid of it. I can understand those motivations. And in fact, yeah, I share them, but I still think that it's at least coherent to be a proponent of a dynamical, of a geometrical view if you have other reasons for liking space time or wanting to introduce it into your ontology. Okay, yeah, that's good. I mean, I think the only point I was making was that I think maybe that there's a question about exactly what it is to be a constructive explanation here. And that's kind of what might drive people in. Mm -hmm. Take different attitudes here. Yeah, yeah, fine. Um, yeah, I think the, the idea of a constructive explanation, as I think I mentioned earlier, can be disambiguated in a number of ways. And I think this is a legitimate disambiguation according to which it doesn't look like even an ontologically independent metric field is necessarily qualifying as offer, offering constructive explanations. Tom has another question. He, you want to come in on this? So anyway, just go ahead. So I think I just got I forgot to put my hand down. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. okay. Um, but I yeah I, I well while we're here I think I I share uh, Nick's worries that yeah constructive is. Um, is an inappropriate word to use for the sort of explanation I'm offered here. <laughs> but um, I mean, so maybe I do have a question. So, or a, a point. Um, I thought one one sense of constructive was well, we've got um, a theory of matter, and we're going to um, you know mathematically construct, produce a logical construction that. Um, is going to play the role of space time. Um, if we let in these sort of um, these uh, what was it, the the restricted um, well, restricted account yeah. qualified sorry um, it seems like we've we've entirely lost that sort of notion because now we've just got to you know write down write down an equation it's all um, it's all the advantages of theft over honest soil etc. Yeah, so the, your idea of constructive explanation then seems to be more like maybe the original account from Einstein that you're supposed to build these things up from yeah. fundamental facts about matter. Um, and that sounds, you could define constructive explanation in that way. Um, and then I agree that you might worry about whether even an ontologically subsistent metric field is offering a constructive explanation in this way. So I think that sounds right, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's just another worry you might have. 
I mean, maybe, maybe the term constructive is just too ambiguous at this point and we should just give a bunch of different words for it. Uh, it can still offer a like physical or causal slash causal, I don't even know if I want to say causal, but physical explanation if you're uh, a proponent of the qualified geometrical view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Agreed. Okay. So, any more? I think I think everyone's got their questions. But if that's okay, James, you don't mind staying around? I will. You know, when you, after that, um, yeah, stay around for half an hour, and um, we can chat. Um, you know, whoever, want, whoever wants to stay around can chat. Let's, um, but I'll turn off the recording and the live and the YouTube for that. So for now, well, let's just say thanks to James again for this really, uh, this great lecture, which has been really useful to, I think, to so see you at all this territory. Thank you. Thank you for coming.